All right, so uh, hello everyone. Thank you all for attending. Today, I'm glad to introduce Jacob Schramm, who will talk about procedural content generation for games with generative adversarial networks. Jacob Schramm is, a, is an associate professor of computer science and the current chair of the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science at Southwestern University, which is a small private liberal, liberal arts university in Georgetown, Texas. Dr. Schramm actually attended South, Southwestern University as an undergraduate student, where he earned his bachelor's in computer science, mathematics, and German in 2006. He then attended the University of Texas at Austin, Texas, where he earned a master's in 2009 and completed his PhD in 2014. Dr. Schramm's research focuses on various ways of applying evolution and deep learning to games, from the creation of intelligent agents to the procedural generation of creative content. Some achievements in this area include winning the 2012 Bot Prize competition, which was a Turing test for game bots in the Unreal Tournament, and earning first place in the Mrs. Pac-Man track of the 2018 Mrs. Pac-Man versus Ghosting competition. Jacob, welcome to our virtual seminar. Thank you. Um, so what I'm talking about today kind of covers um, a couple of years worth of a research area that I'm suddenly just very involved in. Um, so the history is that um, back in 2017, a bunch of uh, researchers went to Dogstuhl. So Dogstuhl is this great uh, place in Germany. It's this lovely palace. And this place holds seminars throughout the year where they invite groups of researchers like this group here. And if you look around in here, you can find Simon uh, and see is Diego here this year. I'm trying to think, but basically um, you get to hang out for a week doing little seminars and ad hoc kind of impromptu sessions. And there was a group that was interested in designing search spaces for games. And there was a subgroup within that that thought, well, what if we train a GAN to learn the representation of Mario levels? So what is a GAN? So a generative, generative adversarial network, um, what it does is it produces convincing fakes. And so we have an example here where we have a bunch of training data, which is handwritten digits. So this could be like MNIST uh, digit data. And we have two neural networks. And so one neural network will take random inputs, basically just real value vectors, and produce something that is in the shape of a valid input. And then this other network is called a discriminator, and it tries to tell whether or not a given input is real or fake. Now, at the beginning of training, the generator produces garbage and the discriminator can't tell what it's doing, but you train them both in tandem in such a way that the discriminator gets a little bit better at distinguishing, but the generator also gets better at faking. And by the end of the process, the discriminator is kind of worthless, but the generator can produce convincing fakes given any, almost any arbitrary real valued vector as input. So the early success with this was in 2017. There was this really cool paper on archive that uh, by NVIDIA that showed that you could produce these fake celebrity faces. So these are not real people. These are just fake images. Um, and then what we see here is uh, the result of taking basically a random walk through the induced latent space. So you have these um, random number inputs to the generator and each input generates an output. And then there's some places sort of between interesting outputs that are kind of like weird, like in between uh, steps, but we're generating lots of convincing uh, faces of fake people. And this was finally published in 2018, but we knew about it in 2017. And what we wanted to do was make it work in our situation, but it was a bit different. So celebrity faces are a continuous color space, uh, but we were working with a discrete representation. In particular, there's this website, the Video Game Level Corpus, that has a bunch of data for mostly tile-based games, but, all, but a few others as well. Uh, and we came up with this representation where we represented each relevant tile type as some numeric code. And then of course, here are all the, the visualizations for those. And that gives us basically a 2D representation of a level that's tile-based. But to input this into a neural network, we sort of stretch it into a third dimension where we have um, layers. So here's the, the 2D representation where we see like the number two for the open space and uh, zero for the ground. 
But if you stretch it into 3D, you basically have uh, a layer where you just have a 0 or a 1, a 1 if that tile is present, and a 0 otherwise. And another way to think of this 3D volume is as um, a 2D organization of one hot encoded vectors. Because each vector has exactly one, one value, a single one value, and the rest are all 0. And so this is suitable uh, to train a GAN for Mario. And so here is the first level of Mario. And the video game level corpus representation looks like this. So what we do is we take a window of a certain size. This matches basically the viewing size. We slide it across. We extract the numeric data that gets encoded in the, the one hot fashion I talked about. That's input to the discriminator. It's contrasted with the GAN inputs. You train this, you eventually get a GAN that can produce Mario levels. Now, we wanted to not just produce the levels, but we also wanted to search the space. Um, so you can have a random walk through the space, but we want to define specific levels with certain properties. And so what we applied to that was CMAES. This is uh, a fairly popular algorithm in evolutionary computation. And what you see here is a visualization of sort of a, a 2D search space where the population of points is in blue and it quickly converges to this uh, optimum uh, solution. So um, we're using you know, some ideas of evolutionary computation, um, although CMAES is a bit more on the optimization side than on the sort of evolution side, uh, but it definitely is within that realm. And so we have a generator, we have an optimizer, and the question left is how are we going to evaluate these levels? And so here's another video that people have seen a lot of. Um, this is a fairly famous uh, agent that won this Mario AI competition in 2009. This is by Robin Baumgarten. Um, and we wanted to think about ways of evaluating a level. And so we thought we need some sort of automated agent that's good. And so if this agent can beat the level, then that means that it's at least playable. Um, now, granted, this agent is not perfect, but it's a pretty good uh, one to use. Um, and then not, we wanted to measure not just the progress of the agent, but also uh, how hard the level was. And so we sort of treated the amount of time that had to jump as a proxy for the difficulty, since uh, the more you have to jump, the harder level is generally. Uh, that was the agent-based simulation. We also did some static simulation or, or evaluation based on things like the percentage of ground tiles or ground tiles and enemies, things like that. So how did it come out? Well, this was back in 2018. This was the first paper in this area. It was kind of a big deal, got, got a lot of citations. Um, and basically, we showed that it works. Um, you can train again this way. The, the CMAES can find desirable levels. Um, we did also find that the agent-based simulation is a bit expensive. Um, but nevertheless, running the agent-based simulation does produce a nice fitness curve that you know, Im you know, improves over time. And this is the static-based simulation where we had a given target for the number of ground tiles. And the fact that most of these have essentially no error bars at all means we hit our targets well. The only exception was this range where apparently not many levels have that represent representation. Um, and the original code for that is here, but it's, we've developed other code since then. Uh, and basically, some levels look like real levels. Others are unplayable. This one has um, a big gap, the jump, where you can't really get across this area at the bottom. Um, and then some had this weird broken tile phenomenon. So the GAN wasn't always able to appropriately place these tiles next to each other. So immediately after that, uh, Vanessa, who was one of the authors on that in that group. So this was like a, you know, a big group of people at Dogstool. Uh, it was like six of us including Simon. Um, and Vanessa was one of them. And so she was finishing up her dissertation. She immediately added all these extensions. She improved the tile representation, um, encoded the pipes in a way that just made it impossible for them to be broken, just sort of, sort of cheating a little bit, but uh, it made it you know, look nicer. She also trained on different subsets of levels uh, and showed that if you train on the overworld levels, you get very distinctive overworld types. If you train on the underworld levels, it's a very distinctive type. She also extracted these so-called athletic levels. Um, and the reason for that is that the video game level corpus didn't really properly give you enough data because we couldn't tell how these platforms were moving. And on top of that, the Mario AI framework we were using didn't allow for those platforms to move anyway. So um, some limitations there in the simulator and also in the, the data we were using. 
And then this inspired some people. Um, so other people did similar things. This is some work in Doom. Uh, so these are levels generated by GAN. Uh, this was on archive in 2018, came out in 2019 in uh, Conference on Games. And another thing that came out in that same conference was this multi-step GAN approach. So here, the authors were creating their own game, which was sort of an educational game with puzzle solving elements. And their problem was that they had very little training data and the GAN would often produce levels that were unbeatable. So they had this multi-step process where they would train one GAN, produce some levels, use a solver on the produced levels. And if the level was actually beatable, then they would add it to the training set to then train a new GAN, which was better at producing solvable levels. So that's a nice multi-step process. And while other people were being inspired by this, I was also going back to the drawing board and wanted to focus on a different game, namely Zelda. So this is a gameplay footage from the original Legend of Zelda on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Uh, and you can see the agent link is going around the dungeon, gets, kills the enemies, gets a key, uh, goes back here, the key opens this locked door, uh, and you go into another room and kill some more enemies here. So this is what the gameplay looks like in the original game. Uh, and there's also some puzzles. Um, at the end of every dungeon is a bit of a Triforce piece. That's a, a sort of a MacGuffin that you're looking for. And there's usually also bosses, things like that. So the idea here was how can we generate a dungeon mission? Um, and this is gonna, but before we could do that, we wanted to have our own simulator. And uh, what we ended up making was this much simpler uh, sort of a simulator inspired by kind of a roguelike game. Uh, so this is all, you know, ASCII kind of art um, and simpler to control, but it's the same level. And you can notice how, you know, the agent's moving around, it's fighting enemies, it got a key earlier. So we have the core elements, uh, but we also simplified things quite a bit um, just because there wasn't like a great um, sort of Zelda sort of thing in, in the language we want. There, there is, we did find something in C++, but it didn't, uh, mesh with our existing code base very well. Um, and we also took out bosses and did other things to simplify things. So given this simulator, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to use a GAN, uh, but how are we going to apply it this time? Well, this time we are training on producing individual rooms. So we uh, go through a given dungeon, the VGLC format. Each room is its own um, sort of training sample. We convert it to the numeric codes, and then we train the, the generator and the discriminator in the exact same way. In fact, we use the exact same Python code for this, so it's very generalizable. Now, I said that we simplified things, and in particular, we simplified the tile sets. Um, there's all these different tiles in the original game, but a lot of them are kind of functionally similar, like a wall versus a block is basically the same thing. Uh, we, so we basically reduced it to just floor, solid wall, and water, which is sort of a semi-passable obstacle. We let the enemies pass the water, but the agent can't unless it has a special item. Um, we also made doorways and stairs be walls. Now, the reason for that is that we're only producing individual rooms, but we weren't having the GAN be responsible for con connecting the rooms. So we wanted to have some other process be responsible for connecting the rooms and therefore also responsible for placing doors. And that was done via a graph grammar. And so this is not our idea. This is by uh, Dormans back in 2010. But the idea is that a human desire to find some sort of high level abstract mission. And so here's a mission where you have like a start room, some room with enemies, a room with some sort of key after you defeat the enemies, which leads to a room with a lock, more enemies, and then the Triforce at the end. Now this is the high level mission, but there's a process we go through that elaborates this backbone graph where at each step of the way, uh, any of these edges can be replaced with one of several possible more like detailed graphs. And the process basically repeats like this, where we are randomly selecting rules from some rule set that replaces each edge with a new subgraph. Uh, the yellows are non-terminals and the, the blue with the lowercase are terminals. And so we just iterate this process until we get a terminal filled graph uh, mission of some sort. Dungeon. So every edge is an adjacency in the dungeon. Every node is a room. The symbol in the room indicates some sort of type of content. 
Um, and whenever we want to generate a room, we simply query the GAN. So we're generating a dungeon based on this graph. And we just throw in a random latent vector to get a room every time we need one. When we're building the dungeon, we have to place the rooms adjacent to each other. And that means that some of these edges can't be represented properly. And so those get lost uh, in the conversion process. There's also a repair process at the end. And what you can see here is that after we build this dungeon, there's, if you look at this room right here, we eliminate some of the water tiles right there. And so that's because we have an A star solver that goes through and tries to see if the level can be beaten. And if it can't, it finds places where there are impassable obstacles and it basically erases them. So there was a bit of you know, trickery on the back end of this to make it work, but uh, it produced uh, viable dungeons. And we went ahead and did a human subject study with this. And this ended up being published in the Congress on Evolutionary Computation in 2020. We did a human subject study where people played something using our GraphGAN approach, which is what I just described. And they compared it with uh, a dungeon from the original game. So this is level four in, or dungeon four in the original game. Uh, and also with um, an approach where we use the graph grammar, but instead of using the GAN to generate the rooms, we just pick random rooms from the existing training set of rooms. And the results are pretty complex and I don't wanna go into too many details here, but basically it worked. Uh, for the most part, the three approaches were similar in terms of the ratings from the users, um, which can be viewed as a positive. I mean, we're uh, creating quality content, except uh, we can keep producing an unlimited supply, more or less of it. Um, so that's nice. So based on the original data, we can keep producing quality levels. Um, there's a couple of conclusions. I mean, the, the graph GAN was generally producing more novel and complex things. Um, but also much more chaotic. Um, and if you wanna see more details then they're in that paper. But we were not the only ones working on Zelda. Um, there was other work being done by uh, Toronto et al. Although I say other people, but one of the people in this group was Sebastian Risi, who was also a co-author on that original Mario game paper. So other people slash the same people were pursuing this idea. Um, and so what they were doing was applying GANs to the general video game AI version of Zelda, which is a bit different, but obviously inspired by Zelda. Um, those levels involve, um, you know, going around fighting enemies. And in each of these levels, you have to get a key and then get to a door to beat the level. So that's how those missions work. But the enhancements they added were one, a bootstrapping based training procedure, which is kind of similar to that multi step approach that I mentioned before because um, they would generate levels. Some were beatable, some weren't. Levels that were beatable got added to the training set to augment it and they kept retraining. So similar idea. Um, the other thing they did that was new was they used a conditional GAN where the GAN included inputs regarding certain features that existed in the levels. Um, so that was able to condition the GAN outputs and make it more uh, focused on certain sort of target um, features in the levels. Now, it was around this time that Dogstool had another seminar. And so I went back and some of the same people went back. Uh, unfortunately, Simon couldn't join us this year, uh, but you know, there's Sebastian uh, and Vanessa's hiding somewhere in here. Uh, and so, and of course, Jalin right there. So we were at Dogstool again. And the big idea that Sebastian sort of came up with um, was what if we wanted to basically generate large patterns in these GAN levels? And so specifically, how would we generate larger dungeons with patterns? Patterns such as symmetry, repetition, but also at variation. Um, now, if you wanted to make a big dungeon level, um, you could just directly evolve a bunch of latent vectors. And in fact, I'll show you an approach that does that in a moment. But if you want to have a pattern, um, a better way to do that is to have some sort of indirect encoding. Now, a GAN is already an indirect encoding. So what does that mean? So a GAN um, is generating levels, but it's evolving real value latent vectors. The GAN decodes those real value latent vectors into levels. So that's a level of indirection. 
But what we added was we wanted to indirectly evolve the latent vectors. So an, an extra level of indirection giving us a doubly indirect encoding. And so the way that we indirectly evolve those latent vectors was using compositional pattern producing networks. So these have been around for a while. Um, and this is just some of the cool things that have been done with them. Um, so 2D images, 3D shapes, uh, both 2D and 3D animations. This work was done by one of my students. Um, and, but also some things outside of the realm of art. Um, these are soft bodied robots that actually are um, can exhibit interesting behaviors. Um, and these are firing patterns in a sort of space-based video game. And these are artistic patterns, once again, for a social sort of flower trading game. And there's a lot more of this. So CPBNs are a really cool way of doing things. So what are they and how do they work? So basically they're neural networks, but they're neural networks with, ar with arbitrary topologies. And you allow a mix of different activation functions in every neuron. And the reason that you do that is that different functions can represent different patterns, such as symmetry, asymmetry, or repetition. Um, and then given such a network, you query it across some coordinate frame. So here we have X and Y inputs, and the output of this network will be the pixel intensity. And so if you query this network across just a rectangle, uh, the input to X is here, and that's going into a sine wave function. So if you're looking at the output intensity of this neuron alone, it's basically this pattern. It's sine of X. Um, you can imagine this being like a 3D plot, but looked at from an overhead view. Um, and so that's sine of X. Here we have Y that's also going into a sine. So this is sine of Y. And then when you combine uh, links into a, an output neuron in a neural network, you're basically just adding those activation patterns. Now there's also, you know, weight values that can augment that. But if we assume all the weights are one, um, then if you add those two patterns, you get this. And so we have effectively composed patterns, hence compositional pattern producing network. Now this gets complex really quickly. You can have all kinds of variety of activation functions and connected in all kinds of crazy arbitrary ways. To do this successfully, you need a way of evolving these kind of structures, and that's done with the neuroevolution of augmenting topologies, uh, an algorithm for evolving arbitrary topology neural networks. Um, there's various mutations that create new links, um, splice new neurons along existing links, join existing neurons together with new links, etc. In order to evolve CPPN specifically, you have to add a mutation that can change the neuron activation function, or at least that's what we did. Some people just uh, leave that out. You just create a new activation function when the node is introduced. Um, and we also use this variety of activation functions. Um, the specific mixture isn't too important. What matters mainly is that you have a representation of the symmetry, the repetition, and the variation. But sometimes, you know, having the, the spiky ones versus the smoothly continuous ones does produce some interesting differences. And so that all leads to this idea, CPP into GAN a doubly indirect encoding. So this works um, by querying the space of the dungeon, where every coordinate that we query is a location of a room. In this case, the CPPN takes input coordinates, x and y, and then also r is like a radial distance from the center. Um, so we can get some radial sym symmetry patterns. And then the output from the CPPN is basically a latent vector. Now there's some other outputs too that are used for like managing the structure of things, but the main thing to focus on is that we are encoding latent vectors as a function of their position in the dungeon. And those latent vectors that get output from the CPPN get fed in to a pre-trained GAN to produce a room that gets placed at that location. So we query the whole dungeon, use generate latent vectors, produce rooms. And so that's what CPPN to GAN does. Now we compared this with a direct to GAN approach. And I mentioned earlier that you could just evolve, this is a 10 by 10 dungeon. So you could just evolve a hundred distinct latent vectors. Um, so if you do that, things get kind of messy and chaotic. You can just sort of arbitrarily put rooms together, but it works. And so that was our comparison point. Um, and the way we compared these is using 
a quality diversity evolution algorithm. This is called MAP elites or the multidimensional archive of phenotypic elites. The idea here is that uh, we wanna explore the expressive capacity of the encoding. And we don't just want to maximize one fitness objective. What we wanna do is find as many different ways of possible as representing levels, but for every different way we do it, we wanna get the best possible outcome. So you define a fitness function, but you also define some dimensions of variation and you try to fill basically bins with a variety of cool different levels. And here are some of those cool levels. Um, so these are all from the CPP and DeGan approach. Um, importantly, uh, it's possible to produce levels that fill the space, but that are also still beatable uh, and also have like interestingly lengthy um, solution paths. So basically this, um, the fitness or the quality metric here was the length of an A star path through the level. But we also get some cool patterns. I mean, this has symmetry, that has symmetry. This um, doesn't have symmetry, but it is still a cool pattern. And in addition to sort of the high level patterns, there's also cohesion between local areas. You notice that we have sort of a cluster of rooms here that have a similar layout, and that is also over here. And so you get these sort of gradual transitions uh, between rooms of different types and adjacent areas because the CPPN is encoding the latent vectors as a function of position, but the latent vectors, or rather the latent space, also has a sense of adjacency. So adjacent points in latent space are similar but different. Um, and so we're getting sort of gradual variation in the physical space of the rooms as they're generated. And that's pretty cool. Now, the results from that paper, which were in Gecko 2020, um, we're mainly analyzed in terms of these heat maps. And once again, I'm not gonna go into the details too much, but the, the core takeaway here is that if you compare um, the heat maps from direct to GAN to those from CPP into GAN, uh, the CPP into GAN approach fills more bins in the space and has higher intensity, like which means higher quality. So we're basically able to fill the space of possibilities much better. And we also did this in Mario. Now, um, it's a lot more interesting in a 2D space to generate these patterns. In Mario, you're just generating a pattern across like a line, basically. So the the, the only coordinate is the x-coordinate, uh, but you can still do it. Um, and in that case, we also fill more of these bins. And that's what's being shown down here. The blue line is the, the number of bins filled by CPP into GAN, and then the red line is direct to GAN. So we're filling out the space of possibilities a lot quicker, uh, and so generating more diversity. And now to work by others again. So once again, lots of things uh, were happening. Um, and so this isn't published yet that I, that I know of, but I heard about it at Gecko 2020. Um, and this is basically a way of combining CMAES, which I talked about earlier, with MAP elites. So CMAES is a great optimizer. MAP elites explores a space of diverse solutions. Um, but by using CMAES, you kind of they, they created this new approach called CMAME, uh, so you know, C covariance matrix adaptation map elites, where they're sort of targeting the unexplored areas of the search space more aggressively, and therefore they fill out the space of bins a lot more quickly. And they applied this to Mario, and, and they used the brand new updated Mario AI framework, so that uh, also looks really nice. Um, and so you can go see that paper on archive. Something else which I just heard about very recently while preparing this talk uh, was work where someone took multiple games from the GBG AI corpus and trained a branching GAN on all the data um, simultaneously. So the generator like had this common part that was shared, but then at the end, it sort of branched out into different outputs. So it could produce outputs for different games. And then the discriminator that you'd had separate discriminators for each of those games as well. So it's sort of a way of um, augmenting your training set because you may only have a few examples for an individual game, but if you can combine a bunch of similar games, you get more training data. And you also, in the end, get a single GAN that can produce levels for multiple distinct games. And that's what's shown here. So that was fun to find. Um, but here is what I've been up to lately. And uh, most of the stuff from here isn't published yet, although there's one more paper I mentioned at the end. 
So this is Load Runner. It's an old Atari game. Uh, it's an action puzzle game. Uh, the agent is running around avoiding these enemies, trying to collect treasures. You can uh, you can sort of brachiate over the ropes. You can climb up ladders. You can also dig out the ground, and the enemy will fall in there, and you can run over them. So this is you know in an interesting game. Um, and the challenges that it poses are that, once again, it's hard to find beatable levels. We've sort of seen that in some of the previous domains. And there's also a lot of diversity in the training set. Now, we train it in the usual old way. Um, the nice thing about the load runner levels is that each one is a single screen. So like with Mario, we have to kind of slide a window across the level to like fit it all in. Um, and with Zelda, we have to pick the individual rooms out and things like that. But with Load Runner, just you get one image, and that's one level, and that's all you need. And I mentioned that it was uh, hard to find solvable levels, so we had to have some way of knowing if a level was beatable or not. Um, we didn't have a great simulator, uh, and like a simulator would have been probably too expensive to use anyway. So we made our own sort of A star model of the domain, uh, but even that was a bit expensive uh, because. If you are being serious about how you represent the state, then if you dig out a given tile, you basically ex you're basically exploding the search space. Because once you dig out a single tile, every single location you have visited previously is actually a new state. Um, and so it was being it was too expensive to do that. So we did a kind of cheat where we just allowed the agent to go directly down through diggable blocks, assuming that the positioning made sense where like there was a place for them to stand while they were doing the digging. So kind of made some simplifying assumptions. Uh, we made the downward actions cost a bit more to discourage them. And we got an A-star model that more or less, you know, reflects whether a level is beatable. Um, still a bit costly to run it though, um, if you want to run it a lot, which we did. Um, so we put a limit on our search budget. Um, and then once we had this, we found that the, the VGLC representation of these levels uh, had some problems. Um, like some of the original levels from the original game were not beatable, uh, which we found super weird. I mean, we thought our model was broken first, but it turned out that the, the data was wrong um, because in the original game, there are occasionally these weird tiles that are insubstantial where the agent just sort of falls through them, but that's not represented at all in the VGLC data. So, um, it was basically like you know, unbeatable because you couldn't move through that tile. So we found these issues along the way. Um, but we, and I mentioned also the diversity of levels. So here are all the levels in the game. So it's a pretty big set. Uh, this is 150 levels. And on the one hand, it's nice to have a big training set usually for a GAN, but the level of diversity here kind of proved a challenge for us um, because when we're training these GANs, you sometimes have run into a problem called mode collapse where you can't properly represent the diversity in the space and you just sort of hone in on like whatever is simplest and whatever reoccurs the most frequently. Um, so what we investigated was, you know, what if you have different size training sets uh, composed of different numbers of levels from this set? Um, and so what we see here are the number of levels in the set. And then also this last group is sort of a semantically similar group. If you go back and look, you'll see that a lot of these levels have visible letters. Um, Rush, I assume that these are like uh, initials of designers. There's a person's name, Alan. And so we did a training set that only consists of, of those levels. And then we trained GANs. And then we searched the resulting GANs with map elites um, to see what we could produce. And basically, we have various levels, um, like different GANs fill out the map elites search space to different degrees. Um, but they also produce different sort of portions of beatable to non beatable levels. So in this heat map visualization, each column is a single GAN. And if something is dark purple, it means the level was unbeatable. So this word-based training set produced a lot of levels, but a lot of them were not beatable. And so ultimately, the ones that produced the most beatable levels were ones trained on just 20 levels or 50 levels from the training set. Um, 
And so we're still exploring this a bit, um, but that is kind of an inter interesting finding that we're trying to make sense of. And then the other thing that I have people actively investigating is Mega Man. Um, so this is another old Nintendo game. It's a side scroller platforming game like Mario, but what's interesting here is that the levels do this sort of zigzag pattern. And I think in modern platforming games, like they almost all do this now, but it's kind of interesting when you look back at the original Mario, all the levels just go left to right. No vertical anything. Modern Mario levels do, but the old ones didn't. But so to find an old game that did that same thing, we looked at Mega Man here, but this introduces some problems with knowing where to go and also figuring out like what type of segment to put at a given place. Now, fortunately, there's this cool program we found online called Mega Man Maker that allows you to edit and play um, Mega Man levels. And what we see here is the left is footage from the original Mega Man game. On the right, we have a version of that same level generated in Mega Man Maker using the VGLC data. And so, so the art's a little bit different, but functionally it's basically the same thing, which is nice. Um, and so yeah, Mega Man Maker is essentially like a free um, fan-made version. It's like Mario Maker, but for Mega Man, it's pretty cool. Now the approach that we did to solve this issue of different segment types was to simply train different GANs for each type of segment. So we have one approach where we train a single GAN on all the data, and then an alternative approach where we train seven different GANs. And so we distinguish between horizontal segments, which can go either left or right, uh, and also downward segments and upward segments. And so the reason that we distinguish up from down is that upward segments have to have some way of moving up, either platforms that you jump on or ladders. But for going down, you just need to be able to fall. <laughs> so that's why we wanted to distinguish those. And then importantly, we also have like the corner. So there's a lower left corner, an upper right corner, um, and the reason that we want to have that is because you have to have some sort of gap that leads to the next segment, either on the left, bottom, right, or top side. And so that's why we train the seven separate GANs. And this research is still ongoing. In fact, we're doing a human subject study uh, on this. Uh, and you can participate on this in this online. Um, basically, you just go to that link and uh, you have to download this Mega Man Maker program, but you can uh, play the game uh, and give us some feedback in a survey. And basically, once you have the program downloaded, you just click links and it takes you to the level that you play, which is kind of cool. And yeah, I see someone taking a screenshot. This link will be showing up at the end of the talk as well uh, to remind you. But please, uh, I encourage everyone to take this study. Um, I will also say, like, we have gift card incentives, but they're for US dollar at amazon.com. So they're kind of worthless to you, but, um, but we would love your participation anyway. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about is interactive evolution. So uh, we've talked about different ways of searching, whether it's objective-based or diversity, quality-based. Um, but another way you can search is you let the user kind of interactively search the space. Now, normally when you do this sort of interactive evolution thing, the user gets a bit fatigued because they have to shuffle through a lot of garbage. But with GANs, you tend to produce more well-formed solutions. So uh, it makes the search process a bit better and we basically applied it to all the games I've discussed. Uh, well, all the ones that I've worked on. So Zelda, Mario, Load Runner, and Mega Man. And so there was a paper at Gecko 2020 where we did this in Zelda and Mario. Um, and uh, Simon was involved in this along with several of the other people involved in the original Mario GAN paper. Um, and so here's you know the Zelda interface. Um, and you, you select rooms. You evolve the ones you like. And then what you can do is you can select a collection of rooms. And then there's this dungeonize button that uses a graph grammar to generate a dungeon using those rooms. And then the whole process can be done in Mario as well. So here we are evolving some Mario levels. And then you can also play these using the Mario AI framework. And then, so that's published. Since then, we've done it in Load Runner and Mega Man as well. So this is not published, but clearly you can evolve Load Runner levels too. Uh, you can evolve Mega Man levels, um, and it's you know all the same interface. It's very easy to add to it. And we've also made a way of using CPP and DeGAN interactively. So these are Zelda dungeons produced by CPPNs, 
and a trained GAN. Um, and so you select the ones that have the shapes you like. Um, there are little magenta Xs on rooms that are unreachable by the ASAR algorithm. Uh, and then you can play the dungeon in the interface. So a lot of cool stuff here to play with, some of it published, some of it not. Um, and on top of being able to search the space with evolution, you can also directly manipulate the latent vectors. And so that's what's being shown here is that you can select a level and you have these latent inputs. You can use sliders or just change the numbers directly. This sort of shows the sense of adjacency that's in these levels, because as you gradually change one of these dimensions, things sort of pop in and out of existence, but there's some sort of sense of locality here um, that makes searching the space kind of cool. Now, we also have a way of interpolating between points in the space. And so that means that you basically pick two latent vectors and then you sort of walk a line through that multidimensional space between the two points. And as a result, you'll gradually transition from one point to the other. Um, and if you want, and you can save the intermediate result um, into the population that you're working with. Okay, wrapping up here. Um, so what is this all about? Like what is going on? What issues have we dealt with and what le is left to do? So it's already been applied to a lot of games, but I want to apply it to more. I want to see where the limits are. I mean, most of these are tile-based games, but, but uh, it's been done to Doom as well, so not purely. So what's the limit here? Um, there's different ways of searching. You know, do we optimize an objective? Do we use diversity or do we do things interactively? Do we combine these things? Doing sort of a mixed initiative approach might be interesting. Um, when it comes to diversity, there's a question about how you define that. I didn't get into this too much, but map leads is a bit, um, how it works depends on the bending scheme you use. Um, how do you make beatable levels? Do you change the GAN or do you change the search process? Like, do you augment the training data? Um, and then how do you scale up to bigger levels? Do you combine lots of individual segments or do you just train larger outputs on the GAN. So how do you do that? Um, I mentioned the training data already. And another thing that I'm looking into is uh, the use of conditional GANs more, where maybe uh, you could train the GAN to produce specific types of rooms on demand. So instead of getting a random room, you could specifically say, give me a puzzle room, give me a Triforce treasure room, give me a room with an enemy. Um, and this is sort of an example of what a conditional GAN does, where you, you give it an extra input to like condition what the output will be. These are various people involved in this research. Um, the first three are all undergraduate students at Southwestern University. Um, so Jake has already been on some uh, published papers. Uh, these two guys, Kirby and Ben, are working on Load Runner and Mega Man, respectively. And then here are people I met at Dogstool, or all, well, I knew some of them before, but uh, there's Vanessa, Jalin, Simon, Sebastian, and Adam. Um, and we've been on some papers doing this stuff. And at the end, we have my email address if you have any questions. This is the particular code repository where the most up-to-date stuff occurs. Like basically, I do all my work here, and then sometimes I break out smaller, simpler repositories with more targeted results. But like, this is the monster repository with everything. And then this is that Mega Man study link if you want to do that. And I am done. So 